Okay, so um, <laughs> here we are again. Um, <clears throat> It is 11 o'clock and, uh, well, just a minute after, sorry. And today we have Walter. Woohoo! See, I'm not even going to use a surname. I'm not, it's, it's not no, that I that, don't know that, Mr. Good Patterson's enough, yeah. surname. But yeah, everyone should know you. you. You you should just go by that first name. It's Walter. People kind of know. I mean, that's, that's great. And so, Walter, I will hand over to you for today's presentation on Thank productivity you. tools. And I will feel suitably productive after the session is over. I'm sure you will, Kenji. <laughs> More than usual, yeah. <laughs> so I can let you, you can share the screen if you, I think. I can, you, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, you have all the rights. Um, to, 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 to. I felt a song coming on there. Yeah. Sorry, my screen sharing is paused because I need to make it. How do I launch my presentation without obscuring everything? I think that the if you launch your presentation, it, it will be fine. You'll still see uh, your face appear in the top right hand corner well, I, uh, or, okay. or on the side. It'll just overlay everything. And in the actual recording, um, you okay. don't see everyone's face. You'll just see yours at the top right. Right. Cool. Off we go. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, um, and apologies to the few of you who have heard the substance of this presentation before, because it was, this is an adaptation of something I did for the NMIS skills project at City of Glasgow College, which was intended for teaching staff in, in academia to try and help improve aspects of productivity and also to move towards digital in their teaching and learning. So this was just a little part of it. It was actually a seven minute presentation, but um, I'm going to, I've added in one or two things. Um, so the, the first thing is about personal productivity is that there are a whole lot of things we can do that I would call simple fixes. And Fiona demonstrated one of those yesterday and that was the use of speech dictation to rapidly enter the draft text um, my own favorite is google keep i found that a great little tool for dictating and then transferring information across into a document and uh, i've used i have used siri on an apple um, i haven't done so well with microsoft word dictate it doesn't seem to like um, a Lanarkshire accent, but others may find a different experience with it. But I would say that that's a great place to start in terms of productivity, is to begin to move towards um, options for entering text. The other one is that um, the Google Keep app allows you to take an image of some handwriting in a notebook which I've just done five minutes ago, which detained me. And then you can grab text from image. You can also do the same things in products like Evernote. So there are quite a number of ways in which you can be more slick and productive about getting text into documents. Um, so there it's their handwriting to text. The other tip that I always give people is to get really familiar with the keyboard sh shortcuts. Now, most of you will know Control C and Control V and Control uh, Alt P for, or Alt Print Screen, those kind of shortcuts. But there are in fact quite a number of keyboard shortcuts, particularly in the Windows environment where you can avoid taking your hands off the keyboard. You can simply begin to launch new windows and you can open up new tabs in your browser. So I would suggest that that's a worthwhile investment to improve your productivity. Along with that, we've got the whole business now of moving towards um, screen-based input. And the, the top row there shows you the typical gestures that you can use on 
an iPad or an iPhone. And most of them are familiar to you, the single tap, the double tap, the scroll, the flick, the swipe, <laughs> the swipe up, the swipe down, the left and right, the pinch and the zoom. But what you're probably not so familiar with are the multi uh, gestures, the uh, multi finger gestures. And these are well worth learning. For example, if you put two fingers on your Apple Watch, it will speak the time to you. If, you, if you're in, in, in the Chrome book environment, if you put your cursor over a link and put three fingers on, this, on, on the trackpad, it automatically opens that in a tab. If, you put, if you're on an Android phone and you put three fingers down, it will do something else. It will take a screenshot. So learning these kind of tips and tricks is well worthwhile to improve your the speed at which you do things. Now, I know you're saying um, these are seconds at a time, you know, it's only a few seconds, but actually when you get into, you know how we talk about flow in, in terms of using IT, digital fluency and getting into the flow. Well, these are all things that help maintain um, a state of flow when you're trying to be productive. The other great Distraction for us, um, things that can be really troublesome like that uh, calf in the bottom right hand corner there, it's causing people a lot of trouble. And notifications are like that. They, they, even although we don't answer a notification, it pops up in the bottom right hand corner of your screen or the top of your iPhone or Android screen. And it actually interrupts your thought process because you begin to think, I'm not going to answer that, but I wonder what it was. <laughs> so actually finding ways to manage notifications, either by saying, turn them off for the next hour, or saying, I only want to see notifications between eight and nine in the morning and four and five in the afternoon. And each different environment, each browser, each um, phone, operating system, they all have their own ways of dealing with that. So I suggest another investment of your time to save time. The other thing that occupies a lot of our time is of course our inbox. And so much has been written about inbox management. If you Google it, you'll find thousands and thousands of videos and blog posts that all people give you something about their own experience. But you'll see in the top right hand corner, delete, delegate, respond, defer, do. So there is, in fact, a little system that you can adopt that helps you manage your inbox. Um, I would have to say that the image on the bottom right the inbox zero is something that I personally have never accomplished. But the interesting thing is that you actually can get software that helps you. So here's one product called Sanebox, which is a paid for app. But it actually begins, it's, it's got a bit of artificial intelligence. I always shudder when I say that word because I know it's not really artificial intelligence. It's, uh, it's a wee man sitting watching what you're doing somewhere in China and he's um, modifying your software to, to um, accommodate what he sees you doing. But anyway, you'll see on the right hand side the kind of things that a product like Sanebox will do for you. As well as access, you'll see on the bottom there, Inbox Zero Academy. I've often wondered what that was, and maybe Kenji will tell us afterwards, because he's a man that knows about things like that. Now, another distraction for us, particularly now that we're working at home, there are other adults in the, home, in the house working from home. There may be children who are not at school. There may be the washing machine going or something else going on in the house. And so what, we would tend to do then is to say, I'll put on my headphones and I'll play some music. I'll play some James Brown, for example, or I'll play some, um, some Sting. 
um, or uh, the Ray Conniff singers even. But that actually is a distraction in itself. So what I recommend is that you subscribe to a, an app and uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a, a typical app here, um, if, I, if I can. So this is one which is called White Noise, but these I've, I've shown two others there. Uh, white Noise is what um, uh, promotes focus, brown noise promotes sleep, so you want to get the right app. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn up the system volume here, so you can So that, that last one was interesting because that was you being in a coffee shop. So these, you know, you can imagine yourself in different environments on a train journey or sitting by a, a, a gentle stream or by the seashore. And they do have this effect of masking out other, other distractions. I spoke about focus a moment ago, that white noise helps you focus, but we all know that that when we want to focus on work, normally we're only able to do that for a limited amount of time. And I guess people through want and habit have found that 25 minutes is about the right time to be focused. And we know that from our teaching and learning, don't we, that we, we often find that students, they can focus for 15 minutes on a lesson or 20 minutes and then they drift off. So the Pomodoro technique is to manage your own work. So instead of using the kitchen timer, oh no, sorry, you can use the kitchen timer. It works just as well. And so the technique is there. You can Google that and find out for yourself, but it's a pretty simple um, approach to, to this. So when we're finished this session, we'll all get up and do a little bit of yoga or chair yoga and uh, settle back down again. But here's something interesting. You can actually get some software that helps you do this. So here's one called Focus Booster. And so why is this better than using the kitchen timer? Because as you'll see from the bottom of the screen, it shows a, a client, City of Glasgow College, the World Skills Training Plan, and I spent one session of 20 minutes. But once I've done a second session on that, or a third or a fourth, I begin to get some sort of timeline about where am I actually spending my time? If I'm using Pomodoro, where am I spending my time? And that can help forward management of your time. What are the things that you really are the most productive on? So that leads me on to the, the whole business about productivity itself and the art of getting things done, or GTD, uh, which is, so if you Google anything about productivity, you'll find references to GTD, getting things done. And the little set of uh, sticky notes there, post-its, tell you exactly how it works. That individual tasks uh, begin with something that's kind of uh, there, I've got to do it sometime, and then they move on to the stage where they're beginning to get a bit more urgent, and then they become urgent, then you're doing them, and then they're done. So literally, you're just moving those little stickers from one to the other, and that's the, the fundamental principle of getting things done. But the key is to be systematic about it. So if you want to learn more, well, Amazon is full of books about it, as you can see. Um, you'll get a copy of this um, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I, I presume Kenji will organize that so that you can look up any particular ones. But there's the workflow you capture. So it's called the collection habit. You're, you're, you're capturing things that have to be done. You're clarifying them. Then you're organizing them into those kind of, are they cool? warm or hot or do I should I have been doing them from now um, there's the whole business about reflecting doing a cycle of reflecting on a, on a weekly or 
either a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis and the whole the whole idea of this cycle is to to allow you to be to be focused on the things which are important and and uh, so I've said at the bottom there, each stage is supported by a digital tool. Um, I found this a, 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 a more easy to understand diagram, that you've got an inbox in the top left hand uh, part of the screen. You're deciding whether things are to be actionable now or put aside till later. You're then saying, is this a very short thing? Can I do it now? Is it an email I can answer now? Or is it something that it needs more thought and I can either defer it or delegate it or begin to action it? Uh, and then there are things which become projects. Now, there is a complementary approach which is called the Tiago Forte, building a second brain approach. And but it's actually pretty much the same. It's about um, getting some kind of fluency into your task management, uh, beginning to get good habits about the way you handle your data, and then thinking about how you're going to manage the, your, your personal knowledge. So the way that this works is that you've got some digital method of getting all of the information into a place. You've got some way of summarizing that and then dividing it up into projects, areas, resources, or archives. So again, the detail of that can be found by going on to the Tiago Forte website, building a second brain. Now, the tool I use for this is Evernote. I capture as much as I can using the Evernote tool. And that allows me to begin to, um, well, classify and categorize the things I have to do. So I'll come back to that. Oh no, here I am. Here's, I had moved this slide. So this is called um, Evernote. It's a, a well-established product. It allows you to um, have notes in notebooks and you'll see a set of my notebooks on the left hand side and you'll also see um, something to do. I've, I've done a search on Python and it showed me all of the things in my notebook that relate to Python. Um, you'll see that I have captured in the main part of the document, I've captured um, a, a web clip and I've done that using a clipping tool that we that Evernote supply. Um, and you'll find that there are lots of clipping tools and they are, folks, clipping tools are invaluable as long as you've got somewhere to clip them to. And so that's why OneNote and Evernote um, are good products because, because they allow that. They allow you to clip things from the web, either as full articles or simply as as in, in this case, this one here is just clipping the web reference. How am I doing for time, Kenji? Almost up? Uh, no, 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 10 minutes, 10 minutes. I've got 10 minutes for yep. chat though. Anyway, let, let me move on quickly to, um, oh yes, th th this was showing the OneNote Clipper. So um, Microsoft OneNote, which we covered yesterday, also supports a web clipper and gives you a structured way of holding information that Fiona explained yesterday. And that was a great presentation. So if you want to learn more about using OneNote as a repository for your knowledge, your personal knowledge, that's the place to go. Another productivity a set of productivity tools is, um, of course, to-do lists. And they've become more and more sophisticated over, over the years. Um, some of them are quite simple to use. Others require you to have a predetermined structure. So this is one, um, an app called Things 3. 
And you'll see that on the left there, there are some organizing structures. Today, upcoming, anytime, someday, logbook trash. And this is the thing that's challenging about using these, these apps, and that is that you, you have to determine what structures are going to be suitable for you. But fortunately, you'll find lots of blogs of people giving what they've used as structures for these kinds of apps. So this one here is a Todoist example. And this is interesting because it shows that you can start off with a set of, of things to do, just a list. But if you begin to add information about those things that you have to do, you can then go back and use the app to begin to give you something in the way of information about, a visual information about your, first of all, your productivity on the bottom there, those bars, and something to do with your, the way that you're progressing through the tasks that you have to do. So if you look at the top there, it says your productivity, 1,254 completed tasks. Folks, that's not me. I'm retired. <laughs> then just one last thing um, I want to talk about, and that is the use of, of digital tools like Trello, Asana, and Zoho, which are all tools that allow you to manage projects. And the key thing here is that you're no longer just working with your own little set of post-it notes that you're moving from place to place. The to do, doing, and done, you'll see that familiar structure there. But you're actually working with other people. You've got any one task, you've got members who are assigned to those tasks and due dates. You can then begin to look at who has been assigned to particular tasks. And you can also change the view into more of a, of a, a flowchart type uh, where you're looking at who, who, where are we in the timeline, who's got a task that's live, um, and who is going to pick up on the output from that task. So these are, these are pretty good ways of managing. And there's another example. So you'll see along the top, backlog ready, in progress, and done. So the, the idea here is that you, you can use these apps to structure um, work in a project, to allocate it to individuals in a team, to track, use the timeline features to track where you are with the tasks, and overall to become more productive. So I'm going to finish, Kenji, with, um, with this slide here, which is a website called keepproductive.com. And there, there is an associated YouTube channel. And so the apps I've talked about today, Todoist and Things 3, Notion, Bear, Evernote, OneNote, you'll find on these channels detailed um, tutorials that would help you get started and help you plan and become more productive. So with that, I'll stop sharing and go back to all the pe oh, you, people have stayed with me. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent, Walter. I, am, <laughs> I, I was slightly distracted um, by my daughter uh, during your session. Um, That's all. So That's I'm, all right. Yeah. I, I was looking for that slide for the, the managing children. I, I feel that's missing from the productivity. That's critical. That's what I need. I, I need that extra hidden slide. <laughs> yes, and, and I see James is commenting that he founds Evernote to be better established, cleaner, and more efficient than OneNote at doing the same and similar tasks. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I have switched between Evernote and, and OneNote several times, and I keep coming back to OneNote. I'll do, could I just add, uh, hi Jason here, um, that um, 
the 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 difference for me was the integration with Outlook that I found the um on from home you might know it's up in the menu there's Outlook tasks and it allows you just to select a bit of text and create an Outlook task straight off from there and that's integrated with Microsoft to do as well of course Microsoft's uh, packages integration effectively so much as I like Evernote and have used that for quite a while as well for other reasons then um uh, the integration with OneNote is the the, the advantage yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Jason. It's good to get everyone's perspective. That's the purpose, I think, of these of these sessions. Um, yeah, integration is an important thing as well. But but I I like Evernote just as a as a building a second brain. It's everything I, I've captured, and I know it's in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? I just wonder if anyone has experience of, of using like a, a Mac or iOS ecosystem and if there's a best sort of planning organizational tool uh, in those systems. Um, I know people work often, maybe Evernote and other cross-platform solutions are, are better in that sense um, because you often switch between a Windows environment, certainly within a college and university setting and, and perhaps Mac at home. I know I've encountered that a few times. Um, <clears throat> Does anyone have good productivity uh, tips to share? Uh, I, <laughs> I I saw a few a few examples of shortcuts <laughs> uh, in there. Oh, Jason has some. Yeah, just a little story. But uh, the reason I have and I'm getting it down eight thousand six hundred emails or whatever it is in my mailbox is the propensity for our organisation to send information by email, which I then have to um, sort out myself. So it's not communication; it's information, which I should be able to search and find. I can find it in my inbox. I'm pleased to have read all my emails at least. I'll tell a story, and I, I hope um, Aberty are well. I hope they, they would mind, and I'm sure they wouldn't. But when um, I was at Aberty and we got our new shiny exchange server back in the day for the first time. Uh, the first thing that the IT service did was email the exchange user guide to all staff. Now it was, I think it was about nine meg in size, promptly at that point shutting down our email server because it couldn't cope with emailing all staff a nine meg attachment. And the question was why not just send a link? And I think for organizations and culture, it's worthwhile actually taking a step back to aid productivity, thinking about the accessibility of information, uh, having it properly curated. And we do have people who are good at this, of course, uh, within our organizations, uh, rather than this uh, cultural habit, perhaps, of just emailing documents, sometimes very large ones, to lots of people and leave them to have to file it. Can I just uh, make a wee comment that that's quite interesting. Um, what you're saying, obviously, about uh, preferring links to preferring content in the body, because uh, I report to the marketing director at present, and we've had a lot of feedback from staff that uh, staff internet announcements should have the shouldn't have to have an extra click to get to the information. That the I, I, we disagree with that, of course, but staff are used to having all staff emails, and uh, we've kind of really cut down. In fact, it's only the SMT that can now send all staff emails. But it's it's interesting that you know there's that kind of trade off still to this day. I remember back when I was based at Telford College, the, the Telford staff on their email, and this would have been going back, well, now, my, now 10, 12 years, but there's a 25 megabyte limit on inboxes for email. <laughs> that, and, and that necessitated everyone being very economical with their, their emails um, and, and including links rather than attachments all the time. But uh, certainly, I, I, I think... I, I think including links is an excellent idea. That's that's okay. that's the way forward. Scott's got some valuable tip to share here. No, that's and not a valuable tip. No, I just just a comment. Um, as we've moved into SharePoint, we more and more we've started to use links just because that's the way SharePoint works. And certainly, we're finding that you know I think there was quite a bit of resistance at the start, but I think the people who have actually engaged with it are finding it's a really good collaboration tool. I work with colleagues remotely all the time, so so creating documents together, you know, writing up proposals, uh, frameworks, things like that. It's just fantastic for that. The other, the other thing I would say, and it's an old one, and it's just, com it's just uh, a tool that I've started using again recently. I used to use Delicious years ago, and then I moved to Deagle, and 
I know they sound like old tools, but I'd totally forgotten that I had an account with Digo until I was uh, reading something else that said, oh, Digo's a good tool. And I thought, oh, I'll have a wee shot of that. And this is quite recently. And then I went in and I said, oh, you've already got an account. I opened it up and I had a lot of old links there. Um, but I've started to find that really useful, especially switching between different browsers as well, because they've got the, uh, the wee um, plugins for it. Um, and certainly in our uh, university, we are not allowed to install anything. The plugins still seem to go in, which is great. Um, and switching between uh, machines as well, you can carry it along with you. So all your, your and if you use proper tagging uh, and order things properly, I find that really fantastic, especially with this current situation. So much information coming through. I mean, I just created a tag COVID-19 in mine and everything that I find that's related to that, that's helpful for staff and students. I'll either tag it COVID-19 students, COVID-19 staff, and whatever it's related to, and I can pull them all back up in a second. So I find that a really useful tool. Okay, and I think that was a useful uh, note. Yep. Uh, oh, sorry, no, no, I well, have one I more, wonder, Walter, I just, yes. I just wondered if anyone else had a, a, a curation tool that they're using, other than the ones we've talked about. I mean, curation is a very important thing for us now, I think. I, th I think the, the most important, I, I remember using Delicious and, and Bookmark uh, organizers in the past. And I think the important thing is from the very start, you have to be organized about categorizing and tagging things. Um, and it's it's because I remember starting off with Delicious and, and just I was finding loads of stuff and just sticking them into my, my bookmarks. And then I went always thinking I'd go back and organize it. And that was just a bad idea because I ended up with like 200 things and I just never found the time to organize it again. So it's, it's from the outset, making sure that you tag, you categorize and get that sort of system in order from the beginning. And it just saves you a world of pain later on. But any, yes, uh -huh. any, oh, um, Fiona said pocket. Let's end on Fiona's, Fiona's description of Pocket. Sorry, forgot how to unmute you. <laughs> uh, Pocket's just, just a curation tool the same as any other. Um, it's a Chrome extension. So when I'm on any website, I can just add things to my pocket. I tend to use that more for home use. So uh, we've been building a camper van for the last year or so. So anything to do with um, building our camper van stuff, I just stick things in my pocket for that. <laughs> I've not used it so much for work, really. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, Walter, oh, that was good. So I, I, later you could send me a link because I had a quick look for Pocket on, online there and I found a save to Pocket Chrome extension, but I'm not sure if that's the same as just Pocket. I um, think the URL is get Pocket. I'll put it on. Okay, so um, yeah, last question, a final question to end on, because I can see we're just a, a, a minute or two over. Um, Walter, what, what, was your, what was your music recommendation? What was your track listing choice for today's session? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yes, well, uh, I thought about cutting through all the confusion and distractions, so the windows of your mind is the track I chose. <laughs> Excellent choice. Yeah. So okay. These, these tools will help you cut through all of that, yeah. <laughs> and that was the Sting version of it rather than Alison Moyer or the Ray Connie singers. <laughs> Again, I still want to look through your record collection at some point. But <laughs> okay. okay, on that note, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we've, we've just run over a little bit, but um, please do join us tomorrow uh, where we will be um, joined by Learning Technologist of the Year 2019. Yes, yes, prestigious, almost royalty in terms of the learning technology community. Um, <laughs> and that's Lizzie Seymour, uh, who will be joining us from the, so I'm just going to say Edinburgh Zoo, but it's the, the Royal Zoological Society of something, I'm sure I've got that wrong. But, but um, yes, come along and listen to Lizzie talk about all things YouTube. So until then, um, wishing you all the best, hope you all stay safe, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you, <everyone. laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>